Hello and welcome. This is Martha Malone with the Industrial Research Institute and I am happy to welcome you to our brown bag today on strategic portfolio management. Um, I am also joined here by Michelle Tausick at IRI and we'll introduce our presenters here really briefly, quickly. Um, the session today is brought to you by IRI industry partner Planisware. We're happy to have them here with us. And I'd like to introduce you first to Michelle Delafar. He is the sales director at Planisware which is a Gardner recognized provider of product portfolio management software and services. He's an internationally experienced executive with a passion for and proven ability to identify value added solutions for organizations focused on innovation. He's helped numerous organizations get innovation to market and Michelle has also had the immense privilege of working under Dr. Bob Cooper's leadership for five years and partnering with him in various capacities for the past 17 years. Again, welcome everyone, and I will turn it over to Michelle. Thank you very much, Martha. I am delighted to be sponsoring this event with the Industrial Research Institute today. My name is Michelle Delifer, and as Martha said, I'm a sales director with Planisware. Planisware is the name of the company as well as the product. Planisware is a project portfolio management software focusing on supporting the new product development business processes from end to end. And we've been in business with top leaders in innovation for over 20 years. Planisware has over 300 corporate clients serviced from 10 locations across North America. In recent years, we've been highlighting thought leaders such as Dr. Cooper at our user conferences and when our customers have asked for more substantial business learning formats, we decided to enhance our software services by offering and sponsoring education dedicated to process improvement in NPD, new product development. We have launched the Planisware Center for Excellence to champion, on one hand, established proven best practices in project portfolio, such as today's topic, as well as emerging and promising practices for NPD organizations. I, as Martha said, I was fortunate to work with Dr. Cooper for many, many years, and we've been engaged delivering workshops and guiding clients ever since. And now, uh, my tremendous privilege in introducing Bob. Bob Cooper is a world expert in the field management in the field of management of new product development and product innovation. Bob has written seven books on the topic and has published more than 120 articles. He is the creator of the globally employed stage gate process used to drive new products to market. He's a fellow of the Product Development and Management Association, the PDMA. He is an ISBM Distinguished Research Fellow at Penn State University as well. He's a noted consultant and advisor to Fortune 500 firms. He also gives public and in-house seminars globally. Bob divides his home life between Toronto, Ontario, and Sarasota, Florida. Many of Bob's publications have appeared in leading magazines and journals. Bob, by the way, this is a beautiful picture of you. Bob will be running our master class in Chicago on June 13 and 14. And that will focus on innovation strategy and portfolio management again June 13 and 14 in Chicago. I will also be the host of that event. Bob, thank you for agreeing to present this session with us. Over to you, please. Thank you so much, Michelle and Martha and everyone else who's tuned in uh, this morning or this afternoon. And uh, let's get underway. Um, the topic is uh, portfolio management and innovation strategy. Now, we have a book out on this topic, and, and let me tell you, it's, it's a complex topic. Uh, the book, uh, which is probably about 300 pages, doesn't do it justice. So I think you're going to be, uh, we're going to be a little pressed for time here to get into the kind of granularity that some of you might want to get into. Um, and I guess that's why we, we do the webinar, but we're also hoping that you'll uh, have enough interest to come to the seminar as well, where we have two quality days to delve into the topic in a little more depth. 
Um, before we get into the into this, uh, we we did we've done a number of studies with the American Productivity and Quality Center in Houston, which I guess is the largest not-for-profit benchmarking society in the world. Now they focused on product quality for many many years, but in more recent uh, decades they've started to look at uh, things upstream from from manufacturing, such as uh, R and D uh, and product design, etc. And in our benchmarking studies with their many many member companies, and they're they're in the hundreds thousands. Um, we find that four themes stand out as the key to success. When we look at highly successful, innovative companies, companies that make a lot of money and achieve their objectives, etc., four things consistently stand out. And the first one is successful businesses in product development seem to have a robust, well-articulated, well-communicated, and right-on product innovation and technology strategy. That's up at the top of this, this diamond. The second theme is they make the right investment decisions. So not only do they have a strategy that gives them direction, they put their money where their mouth is and actually make the right investment decisions, which is what portfolio management is all about. Portfolio management is a relatively new term in the lexicon of new product development terminology. It, it first came to the fore about 1993 when some group in Boston, I think it was Arthur D. Little, published a book called Third Generation R&D, where they talked about making the right investment decisions and borrowed a term from the financial community, namely portfolio management, the same kind of term they would use to manage your pension plan or something. And, and many of the techniques that financial portfolio managers use, with modification, it was argued, could be applied to product development because what we see in product development is that every R&D project or every new product project is an investment. And just like investments in the stock market, they can be managed. They can be managed, you know, when to buy high, when to, you know, when to sell high, when to sell low, etc. And, and these, some of these same techniques can be applied with significant modification. So that's what portfolio management is about. It is not project management, by the way. It's portfolio management, making the right go-kill decisions. Uh, two other things, since I have this diagram up here, two other things you might want to think about, not the topic of today's discussion, is, is execution. And that's at the bottom of the diagram. Having an effective idea to launch system, or as Michelle had pointed out, I, I came up with a, the StageGate process some years ago. Most companies in the United States, and in fact globally, in the Western world anyway, are using some version or variant of StageGate. Um, Michelle's organization is sponsoring another event in California in the fall where we get into what's new in StageGate. And Michelle might, uh, uh, might want to get some information to you on that later. And finally, and a very important topic, and one, again, not for today, but something you should keep in mind, this diagram wouldn't be complete without it, and that is the people side of the equation. Having a positive climate and culture that fosters innovation within the corporation and the right leadership from the top. So these are the four elements that we find common to successful businesses. As a bit of a sanity check here, you might want to judge yourself or, or measure yourself on each of these. Do we have a well-articulated, robust, and right-on product and innovation and technology strategy? Do we have a portfolio management system that helps us make the right investment decisions? Do we have an effective idea to launch system, an up-to-date, proficient, well-oiled, adaptive, agile, an accelerated process to get new products to market? And finally, do we have the right climate, climate culture, and leadership? These are the four keys to success. Now, let's spend a little bit of time on the top one here that I've just highlighted, and that is the first part of uh, of our session today, a product innovation and technology strategy. Here are some of the things we find. <laughs> new product development goals and objectives, NPD is new product development. About 38% of companies actually have well-defined, uh, clearly articulated smart goals and objectives. Isn't that shocking? You sort of wonder what happened to the other 62% of firms. Uh, uh, by the way, when we look at top performing businesses, and these darker bars are the best performers in the sample of, uh, this is the APQC in Houston again, this is the top performers. About half of them actually have clear goals and objectives. And, 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 and here we have the, the not so good firms. These are the poor performers. Um, so a, a, a very typical objective might be one that 3M uses, uh, and I'm, I've disguised the numbers a little bit here, but for example, a very typical objective at 3M is 30%, in, in this business unit, 30% of our sales by the year 2020 will come from new products we've launched in the last five years. 
In other words, and they call that the NPVI, or New Product Innovation, uh, New Product Vitality Index. It's the percentage of sales generated from new products. Some people translate that into a dollar figure, but very, very clear, time frame attached, very specific, measurable. I go into a lot of companies and they talk about goals and objectives and wishy-washy words, things that are not measurable, no time frame attached. Take a hard look at your goals and objectives. Do you have them? Another key might be, uh, another key we find is that the role of new product development or product innovation is clearly articulated in achieving the business's goals. So for example, and, and one European company I was, I was into not so long ago, and the, they, they, the owner of the business, and it was a family-owned, very, very large global company, in Austria, as a matter of fact, they're in the crystal business. You probably know who I mean. Um, you see them in every every airport and shopping mall, it seems. Anyway, the, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the head of the business was basically saying, I want to see the business double in the next five years, double in size. And he says, I'm not sure we're going to achieve that through opening, just opening more stores. What clearly is, is that new product development is going to have to generate half those sales. In other words, he was clearly articulating the role of new product development in achieving the overall business goal. And once again, we see the top performing businesses do this, have a higher tendency of doing this, the poor performers know. A long-term commitment. You know, I go into some companies and the objectives and goals are, are basically a year or two out, or you say, what's your new product strategy? They show you a list of projects for this year. I'm sorry, that's not a strategy. That's what you're going to do this year. Strategy is typically three to five years, some companies even longer uh, in, in, in terms of of where they're going with their new product efforts, new product uh, programs. Strategic arena is defined. Um, one of the key, oh, let me just back up here. Does anyone know what the word strategy means? I often ask this in my seminars and I get a lot of blank stares. It's actually not an English derived word. It's not a French word either or a German word. It's actually a Greek word and it means the art of the general, the art of the military commander. And, and a lot of what we practice in business in the world of strategy has its roots as far back as 500 BC with the famous book called The Art of War um, written in China. Um, so, and what are the key principles in, in any military command other than having clearly defined objectives? The other key principle is the principle of mass, in other words, focus. Concentrate your efforts and hit hard at one point rather than spreading yourself across a long, long line and, and trying to attack, You're dissipating your effort, in other words, and you're sure to set yourself up for failure. Well, one of the keys to uh, uh, knowing where to attack is having defined strategic arenas, or I guess in military jargon, having defined battlefields. And, and we find that a lot of companies have these, and as you can see, these percentages are quite high. The trouble is when you lower the microscope uh, and gets very specific, we find a lot of them are pretty lame. They're tired, uh, they're sterile, they're barren, there's not much there. It's the same old areas we've been beating ourselves up in the last for the last decade or two. Take a hard look at the strategic arenas where you have defined as fair game, areas of strategic focus for your R&D efforts and their priorities, and then ask yourself, are they clearly defined and are they the right areas? Are they robust, uh, rich areas that we're going to be, that are going to generate the next engines of growth for our business? Another element of strategy is strategic buckets, putting your money where your mouth is, so to speak. Strategy becomes real when you start spending money. So a lot of companies have very nice statements about where they want to attack and how they want to attack and where they want to win and which markets and technologies, but they really haven't said, and in order to achieve that, we plan to spend two-thirds of our R&D budget in this particular market in order to seize the day. Uh, and uh, that's what strategic buckets is all about, and I'll get into that in a little bit later. This is a, a newer concept and uh, a lot of companies that have implemented it and done very, very well with it. And finally, road mapping. I'm surprised that not more of us have road maps in place. I'm talking strategic road maps, not this year's releases of a whole bunch of variants of the product. Uh, in other words, what are the major initiatives? In order to achieve our objectives, what major initiatives do we have to launch over the next five years? And, and obviously, a roadmap is a tentative allocation of resources. It, 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 it makes uh, certain there are place marks in place. Uh, 
so that we have a, at least a vision of what new products we're going to launch. Now, obviously, if you're planning, a, if you're doing a roadmap for five years out, you can't forecast five years. But what most people say is, look, it's a rolling roadmap. You know, we implement the first year, and we have a four-year vision thereafter, and it's updated every year, and that's sort of the notion. Very, very useful exercise, and obviously an attempt to translate strategy, words in a document, into action, specific actionable projects that we're going to do this year and next year and the year after. Um, one of the things you see here is that there's a huge differences between huge difference on this chart between the very top performers, the dark blue guys, and the not so good companies, the companies that are doing lousy at product development. That's the pastel uh, green here, and and and, and it, it sort of speaks to the point that not only is strategy doesn't not only doesn't make sense but it is proven to be strongly correlated with performance. In other words, if you do a good strategy, if you develop and implement a good strategy, you will be rewarded with much higher new product performance. Now, what are the major steps? Strategy just doesn't happen in an afternoon of sitting around discussing at some conference what you're going to do. Usually, most people go through some kind of a strategy process, hopefully um, once a year, at least an update once a year, well, we start with defining goals for new product development, and I've already talked a little bit about the goals, the role of new product development in your business strategy. For example, a statement that we're going to double the size of our business in the next 10 years or five years, and 50% of that's going to come from new products. And then specific goals and objectives for new product development, like the 3M one. 30% of our sales in the year 2020 are going to come from new products that we've launched in the previous five years. The next Moving down the diagram, the next thing is many people spend a lot, lot of time thinking about where we're going to find all these great new products and all these dollar sales. And that's this notion of defining the battlefields or the strategic, the strategic arenas, as we call them. And we get into strat mapping, and I'll get into this a little bit uh, as the session goes on here. Once we've decided where we're going to attack, in other words, which markets, products, product lines, technologies, where we're going to focus our efforts, once we've decided that, then it's time to move down to item number three here, how we're going to win. I mean, it's fine to say we want to get into technology X or we want to emphasize product category uh, Y a little more in our R&D efforts, but, but having said that, what are we going to do about it? What's our investment strategy? How much money are we prepared to spend here? What's our strategic thrust? Do we want, are we going to win by being the low-cost guy, the innovator? And what's our entry strategy if it's a totally new area to us? Are we going to go in alone? Are we going to go in with partners? What's, how are we going to win? Uh, something that a lot of companies uh, don't get into enough. They, they, they define areas of focus, but then they don't follow through and say how we're going to win the, win the day. Then we get down to the next level of strategy. And this is getting more into uh, portfolio management. Some people call it strategic portfolio management. And that is translating our strategy into spending decisions or uh, using a military uh, analogy into deployment of forces, putting boots on the ground, so to speak. And, and there's a couple of different things. One is resource commitment in general, how much we're going to spend overall, R&D budgets, for example, by business unit. Another key one is strategic buckets. Where that money or resources, person power, where it's going to go. And finally, road mapping. Which projects do we envision or envisage doing over the next five or seven years? And, that, and, and this is translating strategy into reality. And now we're moving down to tactical, moving away from the topic of strategy, but moving down into tactical decisions. And this really gets into the guts of portfolio management. Uh, project selection or making go-kill decisions on an ongoing basis. Uh, project prioritization uh, done either at gate meetings or at portfolio reviews. And finally, commitment of resources to projects, uh, to R&D projects. And that's uh, people as well as uh, dollars. And here I just show a sample of some of the tools, et cetera, that, that, that one often sees when one gets into the issue of project selection, project prioritization, and resource allocation. So this is a grand scheme for how all these different bits and pieces fit together. I find a lot of people get very confused. They're working on one piece of this puzzle and often don't see the big picture. But I think this diagram that I've just gone through does give a much better idea of where all the different elements and pieces fit together. So basically, the major steps, uh, one of the things we, we deal with, uh, having, having dealt with the topic of, of um, setting objectives and goals, 
and we do spend quite a bit of that on, on the seminar. Can't don't have the time right now. But that another big, big area and a fascinating area is where do we want to play the game? In which arenas? You know, in order to win the day. And and we spend quite a bit of time on picking the right areas of strategic focus. As one person said to me, one executive said to me, Bob, you know, there's two ways to win at new products. Uh, one way is to do projects right. And he says, and that's what your stage gate process is all about. You know, it's tactical. It's about execution. It's about what you do in phase one, phase two, phase three as you move through the model. But the other way to win at new products, and it's far more important, is do the right projects, be in the right areas. And as he, as he pointed out, he said, even a blind person can get rich in a gold mine by swinging a pickaxe. If you're on, in the wrong mine, no matter how hard you dig and how hard you work, it, you, you ain't going to get rich. But if you're in the right mine, in the right area, and doing the right projects, uh, you know, even adequate, merely adequate execution will make you money. And so we spend a lot of time making sure that you're right playing in, on the right playing field, in the right strategic arena. And we find a lot of businesses are incredibly lacking here. They're in areas that are, are, are barren, sterile, and simply have no headroom for serious product development. We start out with a pretty good industry assessment and a company an analysis to identify a list of possible strategic arenas. And, and the art of good management here is having lots of good options. Uh, far too often, companies limit themselves to one or two possible fields and then wonder why they end up with fields that aren't so interesting. And then we get into a, an exercise of how you identify these and, and next how you pick them, the selection of the hot areas. And then once you've picked areas of strategic focus, moving into generating ideas within these, in these selected arenas, such as uh, defining unmet needs, defining customer problems, profit voids, emerging areas. And finally, that leads you to new products and new solutions that you get underway. The major development initiatives, the product roadmap, the technology roadmap, et cetera, the projects you plan to do in order to realize your strategy. So there's a very logical sequence here. But we, I want to spend a little bit of time over on the pink sections of this diagram, which is, is really the guts of strategy, deciding where you're going to play the game. Um, the industry and market analysis, and we take you through this in great, in agonizing depth, uh, developing maps of the value chain upstream and downstream, undertaking industry structure analysis, identifying your customer, uh, your customer's industry drivers and potential shifts in these, undertaking trend analysis, um, <clears throat> market mapping, uh, trying to identify uh, pockets in the marketplace where there is uh, money to be made. Uh, looking at disruptive technologies as a potential source for some ahas, and finally peripheral visioning. All of these are some of the tools that people use and we use in order to identify areas of interest, areas of potential where you might want to focus your R&D effort. And the goal, of course, is to identify a, a good number, not just one or two, um, a good number of these that you can then begin to assess and lower the microscope on and, and then finally pick the, the one or two hot ones that you really want to focus on. A core competency assessment is part of this analysis. A core competency is obviously something you can do that's better than your competitors, that's crit critical to helping you create new products and services, achieving competitive advantage, and it has three characteristics. And a lot of people get this wrong. A lot of people think a core competency is simply a strength. Not so. A core competency is a core competency if it has these three things. Number one, provides potential access to a wide variety of markets. In other words, it's not so, so narrow as to be next to useless. Number two, it should make a significant contribution to perceived customer benefits. In other words, it, it should be able, you should be able to leverage your core competency to build a wow factor into your products or services. And, and it should be difficult for the next person to copy you. It should be something that's fairly unique to you. So the goal then is basically to identify strategic arenas. Uh, the same diagram again, I'll just take you through it. The strategic arena, well, think of these as battlefields or playing fields where we want to play the game. Uh, what are they? Well, uh, hard to define sometimes, but most people, when you, when you stand back and take a look at, 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 at the strategy, in most cases it deals with markets, market segments or market sectors. Uh, strategic arenas can also be product types, product lines, product categories, or product classes.
They can also be technologies, technology A, technology B, or any combination of these. For example, the product market matrix. This is a product market matrix, for example, from a, a telco, a telephone company, where they talk about voice, data, internet products, and down the side are their various market segments, and each of these cells represents a strategic arena. For example, developing data products for small business home office. And, and these stars simply represent areas of strategic focus where we plan to attack, where we plan to deploy our resources. So this is a, a very classic product market matrix. And there's a number of other tools like this that people use to visualize the, plan, the possible playing fields where they could play the game. The next goal, the next uh, step here is actually to develop a strat map or a strategic map. And basically, there's two fundamental questions we always look at whenever we're looking at a new battlefield, a new possible arena where you might want to play the game. The first one is an external metric, and that's the vertical axis here. And it basically says, is this a rich and interesting area? Like, what do we win if we win? Is this an oasis? Or is this a sterile desert where there's nothing but sand, and we're not going to find very much gold out here? And so that's a very, very important uh, uh, dimension. The other one is our business strength. And you've often heard the old adage, always attack from strengths, never attack from weaknesses. Well, it's true. We find again and again and again when companies attack from strengths, they have about a two to three times per, uh, chance of winning versus companies that are attacking from non-strength areas. So one of the questions we're always asking is, is this strategic arena, is this battlefield, an area where we could deploy our strengths to advantage. And, and out of this comes a four-dimensional matrix, and I'll just sort of flip up what it is here. In the upper right-hand corner, these are the best bet arenas. These two circles here are, are designate strategic arenas. These are high-opportunity arenas where we can leverage our business strength, and also they happen to be very, very attractive. And over here in the polar opposite are the no-bets areas that don't build on our strengths or are simply not very, and also are not very attractive. And then there's two others sort of high on one, low on the other, etc. I think you get the idea. Basically, what we do is we take the, the and it's typically about 10 possible arenas in the business, and, and we basically do an assessment, uh, you know, go out, do some due diligence, get some data, come back, sit around, have some discussion on these, and then try to position them on this strat map in order to figure out which are the one or ones that we designate as the top key areas of focus for our business. And this is sort of the first step in strategy development, deciding where we want to play the game or which battlefields or playing fields do we want to focus our efforts on. At this point, I'm just going to take a bit of a pause to see if there are some questions coming in before I move into the guts of uh, drilling down a little bit more into this, these topics. Who should be developing this innovation strategy? Is it product managers or the head of R&D? And how do we get started? Well, that's a very good question, uh, uh, Michel. And, and uh, I think the first hint is the name strategy is the art of the general. So it usually means that while they, the, the, all the work isn't done by the senior people, they've got to be very clearly involved and engaged in this process. Uh, the product managers, the R&D managers, uh, they're going to provide a lot of the data and do a lot of the heavy lifting, but I find the best exercise to go through is where the leadership team of the business unit uh, takes, takes charge here and goes through a process starting with defining our objectives and goals and then uh, identifying possible strategic arenas where we could play the game, then picking the areas where we want to play the game, etc. And typically, it's a series of off-site meetings out of the office in which the head of the business unit and his or her direct reports, like head of R&D, head of marketing, head of, uh, of manufacturing, finance, and so on, uh, get together along with next-level down people like product managers, R&D managers, etc., uh, and, and, you know, typically, uh, you know, it, it can be a fairly sizable group. I mean, it's not a cast of thousands, but uh, it's not just one or two people uh, clustered away in a room together. So, and this is a process that is multifaceted, cross-functional, led by the top, a lot of the work done, however, by the middle-level ordinary uh, people in the organization. So a lot of input, obviously, from product managers and a lot of input from R&D managers. Uh, as well as, as other folks in the company, finance and production as well, and sales. Um, 
so it, it really is a, a, a business effort, not just an R&D or marketing effort. Very much so. Good question. Yeah, we have a few questions too sure. here, Bob. So the first one was really kind of a focus. Does, does this information relate to service industries or just product development? Kind of speak to oh, that a little bit. I, I'm sorry, I should have clarified that. When I use the word product, I mean anything you, that you take to a marketplace for acquisition or consumption for which you are paid money. Okay. In other words, that can be a service, it can be a software, it can be a combination of service, physical product, and software, anything. Uh, what I exclude uh, is uh, freebies like tech service and support, those sort of things I don't normally consider as a product. But, but everything else you take to a marketplace and charge money for, uh, that's a product. Uh, and so certainly yeah, this, this applies very, very, I've used this, this methodology in banks, financial institutions, and so on, and it works equally as well. Yeah. Good question. So another another question, and I see a number of them coming across. So this is good. You're you're sparking some interest. Good. So one question on the strategic arena is it how talk to us a little bit of how this is different from defining the market. Oh, a strategic arena might be a market, or a market segment, or a market sector, but it could also be a technology. For example, I've, I've heard companies say that, uh, like a company was in the beer industry, uh, you know, one of our areas of strategic focus is the focus on aseptic packaging, uh, uh, another, or high-gravity brewing. I mean, that's a technology. And what they were basically saying is they want to spend a lot of R&D and leverage that, this technology uh, to develop products or, or a technology platform. Um, and so it could be a technology. It could also be a product category. Uh, another company I was w working with was in the pump business, and they talked about high, high pressure, high density pumps, and this, that, and the other thing. Those are products, not markets. And so it, 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 it's more than just market segments and markets. I'm a marketing guy, so I obviously relate uh, very much to that. But I'm fully aware that it might be a technology that you want to focus on, or, or, or a technology and market combination. And that's why I showed the product market matrix. It's, it's more than just markets. But good question. Right, and yeah, and another sort of related question is, picking the best bets makes sense. Are there scenarios where you pick high-risk bets as your arena? Ah, yes, and, and maybe hopping back to that diagram, the high-risk bets are up, up here. Uh, obviously, if you have a, a little more money and resources than the next person, uh, you can always um, afford to uh, uh, take a few chances. If you don't have, uh, if you're not flush with resources, uh, you, you want to hedge your bets a little bit, maybe stay a little bit in the uh, in the more conservative and best bet uh, uh, arenas. But yes, I have seen uh, some companies say, you know, X percent of our R&D budget is going to go into uh, this arena here. Uh, it's a high risk area. We know it's a high risk one, uh, but we have a couple of other ones that are that are going to uh, balance that off. So, uh, but usually that's for the more innovative company and the company that's a little more flush with resources is where I see that. For most of us, we don't have that luxury, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. in, interesting thought, though, what percentage is the optimal amount to put into that? It's a bit like in the stock market, uh, Martha saying, you know, I'm prepared to take 10% of my portfolio and put it in a really, really high risk stuff, hoping that, heck, I hit gold. But uh, most of us <laughs> might not do that. How do you increase risk and learn from failure, which you spoke a little to about? The second part of the question is, how do we learn from failure? And usually, the failures that we have are obviously in the specific projects that we execute, specific new products that we launch, and don't do so well in the marketplace. And I assume the person who asked that question is talking about those kind of failures. Uh, that's usually where failure is manifest. Uh, you know, we got a, we launched eight products last year, and six of them were duds. Um, one of the things that we're going to be talking about, not so much on this seminar, but more in the one in the fall that uh, Delifer is also hosting, um, and that is basically building in learning techniques into the execution process of product development. Um, Martha, as we were talking earlier uh, this morning uh, about an article that has just been released by me in your wonderful 60th anniversary edition of Research Technology Management, Martha, uh, something that you folks at IRR should be very, very proud of. Uh, what a wonderful edition it is. And um, I have an article in that edition. Uh, it's called Agile, Adaptive, and Faster Accelerated Product Development. And there's quite a bit on learning and how we learn from failures. In fact, the notion is 
uh, get something out there real fast, fail early, fail often, fail cheap, and get the benefits of the learning. And that's part of the agile methodology that, that, many, that, that, that folks in physical products, hardware products and services like us, have, are learning from the software field, you know, where they get something out there, uh, a couple of screens that don't even work, uh, uh, work very well, that is, and, and in order to get customer feedback and, and, uh, and learn from the things they messed up and, and move the project forward. So we spend quite a bit of time, but that's more at the execution level. And that's not so much the strategy stuff we're talking about here, nor the project selection stuff. But I, I, I certainly hope people do take a look at that article in your journal. The article is called Idea to Launch Gating Systems Better, Faster, and More Agile. There you go. And it's all about, uh, you know, the, the agile methodology, which basically preaches uh, get something out there fast so you can fail, learn, move on. But now moving into portfolio management, you know, a little bit away from strategy. As you can see, there's a lot more to strategy than we have time for in 25 minutes. And that's why we do take um, the better part, well, the better part of a day, day one of the two-day seminar on it. But let's move into portfolio management, which is about project selection and coming up with the right mix and balance of projects. It's a major problem area. And this is data from the APQC studies, APQC, sorry, studies that we've done over the years. And these, again, are the top performing businesses, which is the dark blue bar, um, and the average business. And then finally, the uh, light blue is the terrible businesses. And, and some of the statistics you see here, the first thing is that you see is that, ta is that just about everybody has too many development projects for the resources available. We're overloading our pipelines. And in some companies, especially the poor performers, where they have a terrible performance here, um, it's almost gridlock. It's like a traffic uh, on the highway, just not moving at all. The pipeline is so stuffed full of projects, uh, often the result of not knowing when to say no. Uh, another big problem people have is poor balance. Far too many minor projects in the portfolio are, you know, I hear comments like our pro portfolio is just swamped by a lot of little tweaks, modifications, improvements, and very minor Salesforce requests. And it's killing us. It's consuming all the resources. We can't get any big projects out. And that's the next issue. We have few or no high value to the business projects in our portfolio. Another significant issue. Next, we have no project prioritization. Uh, you know, all projects are top priority, which of course means none of them are top priority. And finally, we don't even have a portfolio management process in place that helps us make some of these decisions and overcome some of these issues. So lots and lots of key issues here, Un, you know, too many projects, the wrong kinds of projects, no high value projects, lousy prioritization, and no system in place to right this situation. And that's what the seminar now moves into for about a day and a quarter we get into these guts. One of the things you'll notice is that while every company seems to suffer to a greater or lesser extent from these ailments, the top performers, the dark blue bars, are suffering a lot less. In other words, they're doing somewhat better on these. Nobody's perfect. But, but I guess the objective is to get better than the average business here, the, uh, the medium blue bars. One of the, one of the men things I mentioned earlier today in this session was uh, strategic buckets. Strategic buckets is an approach to figuring out where you want to spend your money. One of the things we encourage companies to do is create pie charts like this, and this is, I guess, where uh, Deliver's software, Planisware software also helps, and this is a very simple one, uh, where we're spending our money. Uh, are we looking at, are we spending it on new product projects? Are we spending it in the green area, bold innovations? Or are we just spending our money on a lot of minor projects, extensions, modifications, etc.? Well, that's nice to know where the money was spent last year and the year before, but the issue is, where should it be spent next year? And that's what strategic buckets is all about. The first thing that we get into is management has got to make some strategic choices about where it wants to spend its money going forward. In other words, maybe we spent 5% of our money or 5% of our resources in this green area last year, and we all agree 5% just wasn't enough to move the needle. So we need to spend at least 10% going forward. So management makes some strategic choices 
based on where they spent money in the past, based on how well they've done with some of these initiatives, and based on where the opportunities are going forward. So they make some choices. And, and it can be by project type. And this simple little red, green, blue diagram shows project types. But we also encourage them to do it by strategic arenas. And it, so that would be another pie chart. Or maybe by technologies. Maybe you're into three technologies. Where do you want to spend your money? Or maybe by geography. You know, America's projects, Euro projects, Asia-Pacific projects, etc. So there's a variety of different ways you can split the resources up. By the way, when I use resources, I mean people or person days as well as money. And then the next step is, once. let's say you've decided to spend 30% of your money. Last year, you were spending 20% on red. You say, that wasn't enough. We should have been spending 30%. So that's the decision. Then the next exercise is we take all our red projects, all our projects that are underway or just getting underway, coming to a uh, typically a gate two meeting in the in the stage gate process. Uh, take all of these red projects and 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 rank them one to n. Let's say we got thirty of them, and maybe twenty underway, another ten coming to be underway, and we rank them one to thirty. And we use some criteria such as a gate score or the net present value or the productivity index. There's a number of different criteria you can use to rank your projects from best to worst. And you rank all the red projects against all the other red projects until you run out of red money, until you run out of red resources. And you draw a line, and everything above that line you do, and everything below that line you put on hold or kill. And this is a very, very deliberate approach to try to force your portfolio. Try to force your, force your portfolio so that your resource allocation, after a couple of years, your resource allocation will really mirror your strategic priorities. So you might start out by saying we want to spend 30% or a third of our, of our, our resources on red, uh, and right now it's only 20%. After a couple of years, if you do this religiously and vigorously, you will find the needle slowly moves, and after a couple of years steady state, you will actually end up at 30% on red. The other nice thing about this is it doesn't com the red projects are not being compared to blue, and the green projects are not being compared to blue, because when you put them all into one bucket and shake the bucket, guess which ones always rise to the top? The blue ones. The low, hang, the low hanging fruit, the ones that are certain, fast, cheap. And that's why we end up with a portfolio that is dominated by blue projects. So one of the nice things about this, this method is not only does it force the needle to cause you to end up with a portfolio that mirrors your strategic priorities, you end up spending your money where you want to spend your money, but number two, you don't end up comparing apples and oranges. You're just comparing red projects against other red projects, green projects against other green ones, etc., which, which is much fairer to these projects. Otherwise, uh, they always seem to end up losing. It's a very, very powerful technique. It's not unlike what is employed in the stock market when people are making tough decisions about, you know, when you go to see an investment counselor, what proportion do you put in bonds versus stocks versus uh, real estate? You know, that's a fairly traditional argument. And there are methods for figuring out what, what the appropriate split is. Well, we get into this, how you figure this out. And, and basically, it starts with the business strategy. Because from strategy, strategy, of course, all else flows. Some of the key inputs we get into discussing in order to help you make this strategic buckets decision starts with your strategy, goals, and objectives. Obviously, that's a key part input. Another key input is where the money's been going in the past, because you're never starting with it. You're never starting with a clean uh, blank piece of paper here. Uh, another key issue is what do best in class businesses do? And we've got some pretty good data that we can share with you on where the top performing businesses, how their, what their breakdowns of spending looks like. I, I read it with interest, a Harvard Business Review article not so long ago that basically said that uh, uh, you know companies basically spend 10% of their money on innovations, another uh, 20, 30% on uh, on, on, on sustaining on, on um, new products and then the rest, I guess about 60, 70 percent uh, on sustaining innovation and improvements and renovations. And, and, and they thought this might be a, a reasonable split. I'm not sure, so sure that is a good split and it certainly isn't for everybody. And we get into some of these issues or what are the optimal splits. Oh, here's another interesting thing. We take a look at productivity or yields. 
And think of a farmer putting a seed on three different fields and he measures or she measures the yield. And that influences where they spend their money or where they put their seed the next year. It's the same kind of allocation problem we have. So we look at a number of different factors to determine where one should be placing one's bets. A strategic roadmap is another, another attempt to figure out where we want to spend our efforts, where we want to spend our money. A roadmap is, a, a strategic buckets is at a point in time. A, a roadmap is over time. Okay, so here we have, uh, one's a photograph, the other is a video. And here we have the video, and basically looking at how we put together a roadmap of major initiatives, typically about five years out. Now I know, as I said before, the, the you can't predict five years in advance, but you usually can predict about a year. And so we we update this roadmap every year, and we implement the first five years, the first year only. And and there are some very very good ways of developing roadmaps. Uh, again, referring back or deferring to Michel Delafer's question, who does this? Uh, it's a cross-functional group. In the old days, we used to call it product line planning and it was typically done by the product manager. Uh, no longer, this is a cross-functional group of technical and marketing and, and sales and production people gathered together in a room to map out uh, the key initiatives. And some of the inputs we look at are the strategy and goals, once again, the existing products. And this is where the product manager brings his or her expertise understanding that certain products are getting tired and need revitalization, other, others need to be dumped altogether, others need replacement. Market trend analysis is another key input along with the voice of customer. And finally, competitive analysis and technology trends and assessments. There's basically six key inputs that go into this road mapping exercise, and we do spend some time on the seminar getting into the details of how to do this and how to make it work and how to organize in your business unit uh, for road mapping. So here we've had two strategic portfolio uh, approaches. Uh, one is strategic buckets, snapshot. The other is road mapping, uh, video. And, and uh, both are very, very powerful techniques for translating strategy into reality. Now let's move into the next section. The next section of this seminar is getting down into the tactical, making individual project selection decisions. And one of the first things uh, I would say is that if you have a gating process, and most of you have some kind of a stage gate process in place, at least that's been my experience, make sure that's working. I go into too many companies, they say, yeah, we got a stage gate process, it's been around for 20 years, and then you take a hard look at it and you realize it ain't working. People are just going through the motions. If the gates are broken, your process is, is, is not working. So one of the things we, we say is get back the basic folk, get back, get back the basics folks. Make sure that those gates are actually making go and kill decisions on projects. Because at least if you have some gates with teeth here, you'll be getting rid of the lousy projects. Uh, everything starts out looking good, that's why the funnel is so broad here, and over time the, the objective is to narrow down the field of development initiatives so that you're focused on the best bets. The other comment I'd make here, uh, Martha, is that is that a lot of people are using gating processes that date back to the 1990s. And you know, I hate to say it, they're hopelessly out of date. The world has moved on, and that article that I was referring to in your, in your wonderful magazine, um, research technology management, it is dealing basically with uh, much more agile, adaptive, and effective systems that people, uh, big companies like Lego and, and Honeywell and others have really reinvented their whole new product process in the last few years. This has just happened in the last few years, by the way, and that's what the uh, Planisware's conference in San Francisco is going to be all about, making it adaptive and flexible and agile and accelerated in order to really cut down time to market and also to improve productivity of development teams. But my point here, my first point is, make sure your gating process is working, because at minimum, what it will do is get rid of the bad projects, if, if you really have gates with teeth in there. Uh, portfolio management, of course, and I sort of showed a, a diagram like this before, but this is a bit of a simplification, uh, is, is, is a th sort of a three-level hierarchy, up at the top, business strategy and product innovation strategy. Then we spent some time on strategic buckets and roadmaps, and now we're talking about the tactical decisions. And the tactical decisions are typically handled by two kinds of processes or meetings, if you will. 
Uh, I hate to emphasize meetings and processes, but let's face it, that's the reality. Uh, one is your stage gate system that focuses on individual projects where gatekeepers comprised of management uh, has in-depth evaluations of projects. You know, project teams come in the room, present their, their project data. Quality data, the deliverables to the gate are available. Uh, the decision is the discussion and, 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 and uh, discussion is by senior management. They make go kill decisions. I'm not sure why my cursor is having troubles here. They make they make go kill decisions right at the gate meeting and they allocate resources. They allocate resources. And that is very key. A gate meeting is not just a go kill meeting. A gate meeting is an irrevocable commitment of resources to a project leader and his or her team. Over here on the left side, we have another kind of process going underway. It's called the portfolio reviews. These are not real time, unlike gate meetings. They are periodic, like four times a year, the leadership team sits down and does a review of all the significant projects in the portfolio. Now, it's obviously a much quicker review than the gate meetings because you just don't have the time. A gate meeting might be an hour a project. A portfolio review might be five minutes of projects. And basically, the questions are, do we have the right priorities, the right mix, the right alignment, and so on. And this is done by senior management. So we have two processes going on here. And, and to be very frank, although the meetings are quite different, the kind of tools they use and the kind of information displays that are available at the meetings are, are much the same. So a lot of these tools and methods see double duty. Uh, there are three goals in portfolio management or project selection. One is to maximize the value of your portfolio. And here's a trick question, folks. What's your portfolio worth right now? Now, if you personally invest in the stock market like I do, I can pretty well tell you what my portfolio is worth in the stock market. But can you tell me what your portfolio is worth in your R&D, your R&D portfolio, what it's worth? Interesting question, especially since one objective is to maximize the value of that for a given level of spending. A second goal is to achieve the right mix and balance, not putting all your eggs in one basket between long-term and short-term, high risk and low risk, and across different project types and market sectors. And finally, to ensure that at the end of the day, no matter wh what you do, your portfolio has got to mirror your strategic priorities, has got to mirror your strategy. So the, the portfolio is how you're putting your strategy in, into effect. Uh, and, and also that if you implement this portfolio or execute the portfolio, that you will achieve, in fact achieve uh, your objectives. Some of the tools we can use, obviously there's the traditional financial tools. I must confess I'm not a financial guy, and there's more than enough financial people around, I guess, these days in companies. You're all familiar with these tools, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. Net present value, the internal rate of return, the payback period, and finally the productivity index, which is a tool that I think merits a lot more attention than it gets. It was developed by some guy called Mike, Dr. Mike Menke in California. It, it basically deals with maximizing your bang for buck. You calculate your output over input uh, index. It's an index. And you rank projects by this index until you're out of resources. It, it's a very, very simple calculation once you have a spread, all the data in your spreadsheet. But it's a much more powerful technique than just raw net present value or one of the other techniques in terms of picking your best projects. Productivity index, I'll just let, give you a, a chance to think about that. The other thing that you've got to take a look at is financial techniques when there's a lot of unknowns. You know, one of the assumptions in any spreadsheet when you put a number in it, it's a known number. Well, that's not reality in product development. Most of the numbers you put into a spreadsheet never come true. There are numbers pulled out of the air. And, and when you have small projects, maybe it's not so important that you're wrong a lot of the time. But when you have big, bold projects where there's a lot of money at stake, and I hope you have some of those projects, then you can't avoid dealing with this risk issue. Not every project, obviously, is a 100% chance of success, and many won't achieve their sales and profit projections. Anybody that's done that uh, analysis of what was in the business case versus what actually occurred realizes that what's in the business case and what actually occurs are sometimes different by orders of magnitude. Some projects will be stopped along the way, of course, they hit technical roadblocks. How do you handle all these risks and uncertainties? For small projects, it's maybe not that big a deal, but for a big project with a lot of money involved, you can't duck this issue of risks and probabilities. Risk-adjusted discount factors is one way 
probability adjusted net present value is another way, but the one we spend quite a bit of time on, and it's in one of the articles that I have in industrial uh, and research technology management, is the expected commercial value. And this is a very powerful technique for dealing with risks. The third, the, the, the last method I just want to mention a little bit here is qualitative methods for picking projects. Um, it, it's it's have you ever noticed lately how much new research in the field of cancer, uh, people are looking at DNA and figuring out what type of diseases people are going to get, what kind of cancers they might get. It's, it's rather remarkable how predictive these markers on DNA have become in the last 10 years of research. Well, one of the questions that's always been asked by product people doing research in the product development is, do new product projects have markers? Do they have a DNA? Can you predict success and failure by looking at the profile of a project? And the answer is yes. There's been a lot of research done on this. Unfortunately, it's fairly complicated and, and therefore has not been well disseminated into the practitioner community. But it does exist, and, and I was involved in some of this early research and worked with several big companies like Procter & Gamble, DuPont, and others as we tried to figure out qualitative factors to predict success, things such as competitive advantage, market attractiveness, leveraging core competencies. And, and out of this research and work, looking at many successes and many failures and figuring out what the markers were, what the profile of a winner was, we were able to develop predictive models that were far more predictive than financial models. As, as high as 85% predictive ability to choose a winning project based on qualitative factors before development began. Now, a lot of that was very secret research because it was done within companies at great expense. That has become less and less and more and more in the public domain. And I share quite a bit of these uh, new of these models, revolutionary models in terms of helping you pick the right projects. Some people say, hey, it's nothing but systematic intuition looking at qualitative factors, but it is very research-based. We come up with scoring systems based on these factors, a point count system, and we use scorecards right at the gate meetings. And this has proven to be an extremely powerful way of complementing or supplementing your traditional financial models as well. And finally, the risk reward. At the end of the day, you stand back and you look at your portfolio and say, does this make sense in terms of the risks versus the rewards of our portfolio. These are but some of the tools. As I said, this is a very complex, very rich, full-bodied area, and we, we, we really don't do it justice in sort of 55 minutes here. And I do hope to see some of you at the seminar, because out of all of this, hopefully, comes an effective portfolio management system, fully integrated, that looks something like this diagram. I'll ask a couple of questions. Um, there were a couple of things around kind of strategic buckets and their distributions. Um, one asked around, do we need a bucket, strategic budget bucket for each business unit? And the other was kind of say, talking a little bit about what are kind of best in class for strategic bu bucket distribution. Well, the strategic buckets best in class, uh, <laughs> that's a little bit like when you go to a stock market uh, a financial advisor yeah. saying, how should I invest my money, stocks, bonds, and real estate? And there's no one easy answer. I mean, there's little and it formulas. it depends on everybody's stuff. risk tolerance, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, and I, I think we're, we're going to, we do get into that in the seminar, but it's not the kind of thing I can give a one-liner to. And I think if I did do it, give you a one-liner, you'd be very suspicious of it, and, and you'd be right to be. So it depends on who you are and what your tolerance for risk is and what your what kind of business you're in, et cetera. So we will get into that, but I can't give you a one-liner like, like that Harvard Business Review article tried to, which obviously was very suspect. Um, the, the other part of that question, um, Martha, was... Kind of are strategic buckets um, oh, yeah. done for each business unit? Usually. All of this stuff, to be very frank, all of this stuff is a lot easier to operationalize at the business unit level rather than at the corporate level. Now, now, now one can obviously aggregate everything from the business units up to the corporate and show uh, where the, what the breakdown of projects is across all our businesses. And, and at the corporate level, there could also be some guidelines. But operationally, operationalizing this obviously to, is, a, is a little simpler and makes more sense at the business unit level. Yeah. Thank you again so much, Bob and Michelle, Thank and you. we look forward to having you with us again. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Thanks, everybody. Hope to see you.